how hard did you push it till I black out? Yes. Numerous times, yes. in municipals this is big c we do not have ashton with us this week we have a special guest with us and we played a special track together so this week we are talking about actually we played two special tracks which is awesome you know a little little twofer here so we played pumpkin ridge out here in the greater portland area more on the beaverton side of town it was an absolute blast so Pumpkin Ridge invited us out. Very kind of them. You know, them knowing we are a public podcast, she also said, you know what? If you're out here, you might as well play both tracks. So you know how we do. We don't really jump or uh, dabble into the private sector very often, but because of the accolades of Witch Hollow and me just being a golf freak and a Tiger Woods fan from the day I started playing golf, it it was an experience we couldn't pass up. So I, I think it's going to be a cool pod because we get a kind of a cool look into a, the difference between a public and private track on the same property. So it kind of gives you a good juxtaposition between the two and We'll give you a little inside look if it's really worth to join the public track if the or a private track. If the public track is is better, we'll, we'll let you know there. But we're going to get into it. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of Pumpkin Ridge before we, we jump in and I introduce our guest here. So Pumpkin Ridge was built between 1990 and 92. The property consists of two courses. You got the private side, which is going to be Witch Hollow, and you've got the public side, which is gonna be Ghost Creek. Uh, in its inaugural year, Golf Digest named Ghost Creek the best new public course in the United States, with Witch Hollow as a number two best new private course in the United States. So for a course to be built within two year, or two courses to be built within two years, and then automatically get to the top of the list of Gol- Golf Digest is ridiculous first off so this opportunity was incredible so the one other thing with the property has held some of the best events out there so they had three years of the lpga safeway open they held the 2003 um us am they had the nike tour they had the 2003 Women's Open Championship, the 2006 U.S. Women's Am, the 2000 Boys and Girls U.S. Junior Am, and most famously known for the 1996 U.S. Am that Tiger took his third straight title. So when you go out there, it is super cool because they have plaques in the fairways that talk about where tiger hit you know his famous shot to to pretty much bring it home there's stuff inside the clubhouse i mean it's if you're a tiger fan you're a nike fan it's incredible so no further ado we want to introduce our special guest here my boy tyler munns me and him both met through the rgc chapter here in portland tyler what's happening my man i am doing doing super well chris uh thanks for having me absolutely so tell the uh listeners what your instagram is uh you can find me on instagram at fade and fairway uh, all spelled out so please give him a follow it is a good follow uh if you like equipment and you like boutique golf stuff tyler is your boy so, so That's my please jam. give him a follow. Yeah. Um, so we got the invite. They always, usually courses when they invite us out, they they do assume that we have, it's me and Ashton, which is awesome. Now that me and Ashton are s- separated, we get the uh, privilege of inviting our buddies out for these, these cool events that we get to do. So, you know, Tyler was available midweek to be able to play 36. Not many people are able to do that. So stoked you got out there with me. It was a, 
dude that was that was a great day really it was a fun. blast yeah um so they started this out on the public side so we got to to take a crack at ghost creek so just a little inside i myself and have never played the public side i know this is going to be blasphemy to all of our listeners I've never played the public side. A few years ago, I got to play the private side. So this was my first crack at the public. I was really, really excited because from many people, especially our buddy Zach at Pacific North Golf Guys, um, they they let me know that they, they think that the public side is better. So I was really excited to get in there. Uh, Tyler, have you played either one prior to this? I played the public. Um, I played Ghost a few times in high school for high school tournaments, um, and a couple times, kind of recreationally, um, in college. But I, I never had the opportunity to play the private side, so I was somewhat familiar with Ghost. Um, but it had been probably three or four years since I'd played. Okay. Um, did you see any dramatic changes? Was there any adjustments you think you saw between the last time you played? Uh, no, n- nothing stood out to me um, that, that I could tell. I mean, not, not that I knew the course super, super well, but um, it, it reminded me very much of the way I'd, what I'd seen in high school and a little bit in college. So, Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I was extremely um, happy with, with playing public first because... You know, as I said, I have been able to play the private side in the past. The public side, condition-wise, I don't think you can get much better. I mean, it was, it was, you got everything you would pay for the full rate. So rates for Pumpkin Ridge, uh, average, you can get out there in twilight and, and pay, you know, 50 bucks to play out there and then you can get out there you know on a weekend and it's 120 to play it so it really ranges but i i would say at any rate the course is definitely worth the price that you're paying um every part of the golf course was in great shape for a course that definitely gets as much play as it does what would you say out of all conditions, would you say uh, was the best part of the entire golf course? I mean, the greens were immaculate. Um, gosh, it was it was hard to. They rolled super true. Um, they weren't very quick, but we were playing in the morning, so we were dealing with a little bit of dew um, at, at the first. I would say half first nine holes or so. Um, and then beyond that, the fairways were just, it was, I felt kind of bad about hitting divots sometimes because it was, you know, when you look at courses like Augusta or Shadow Creek or things like that um, on TV when they're playing, um, I, I would say, you know, that Pumpkin is probably the closest thing that we can get to that here. Yeah, for sure. I would say in the greater Portland area, uh, especially on the public side, it's the closest we're going to get to proper championship style golf course for sure. I mean, there's, there's, there's not one public course that's going to be comparable in the entire Portland area, you know, condition wise size, um, you know, e- everything layout all around best championship style, you know, test you're going to get. So let's get into the actual holes here. So first hole is going to be a par four. Not much to write home about, to be honest. Um, it you know we played blues that day, and it's 392. So you know my rule, anything under four, I whip out a three wood, no driver on that. There's a couple bunkers on the right, but not really in play. I would say and then there's a bunker on the left and unless they're tucking the pin back left on you it's a pretty inviting green it runs huge you know it's huge and it runs big from left to right so you know i i would say me and you were both a little uh a little off to start the round yeah 
Um, yeah. So even as inviting as it was, I think we both uh, struggled a little bit. I know I started out with a bogey. Mm-hmm. So it, I think I think I did too. The, it came up a little short. It's kind of sneaky uphill, um, from what I remember. Um, and so it's like you you, you almost want to play it. You take one extra club coming into that green, and um, and it's big enough that you could you could probably be a club short or a club long um, and still still hit the green. So it's yeah, it, it's a. I had it down on taking some notes. It's somewhat challenging, but it's a good start to the round because you can kind of hit your drive pretty much anywhere, and you're gonna find you're gonna find it. You're probably gonna be on the fairway, and then if if you can get it pin high, you could miss twenty yards left or twenty yards right, and still probably be on the green. Yep, yep. And so it if you're, it, it's a good confidence booster right off the bat. Because, like you said, you could blast it all over the place and still miss left or right on the green. You're still going to feel confident because you got a uh, fairway and reg and then a green and reg. So, you know, I can't really hate on that. To be honest, I don't think I got either, but it's definitely <laughs> doable. So, yeah. you know, it, it's a great, great start to a track that, you know, just kept getting better, you know, mm-hmm. hole by hole. And definitely the second hole, par four, uh, 391 for this guy. And this is where the test kind of started, I thought. Yeah. I would. There's bunkers in front that kind of aren't in play. They're probably only about 180, 200 out. Mm-hmm. So if if you're really messing with those, you're hit, you're not hitting a great tee shot off there. But it gets very tight the further you go out in the fairway because this is kind of where the trees start coming into play yeah the uh, 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 when you're on the tee box looking out it's the the trees frame it it looks so tight it opens up a little bit in kind of into your landing area but the far like you said the farther you go down the the more aggressive you are on that hole the the tighter it gets so you know, I, I think a three wood is going to put you probably in the fattest part of the fairway, um, but you're still going to have a, a nice potentially mid iron in um, to a pretty tight approach shot. So it's yeah, it definitely is a uh, a nice little dichotomy from the first hole where you could just hit it off the planet. You're still going to find it. This one, you've got to be a lot more discerning with your so- your shot selection. Oh yeah, I learned real quick as I double bogeyed this by hitting it behind a tree on the right. So if you've ever played with me or anybody that knows my game, I hit a big ass swipey left to right. So this hole does not play well for me. So I got stuck behind a tree, had to punch out, hit a short wedge, and then, you know, proceeded to chip on and two putt. So it was a little bit of a disaster hole for me at how did you do i don't think i remember i part it yeah that's I, right yeah. of course tyler part it but you know um it it's a great hole though and i really love the green on this because it's kind of a front sloping to back plateau so it it's almost like a a false front that then drops off into the back into like its own little bowl ravine and mm-hmm. i really like that i thought it was you know, really creative. The one thing I really like about uh, Pumpkin Ridge is they don't, the greens are their own challenge and they don't have to surround the greens with bunkering to make it challenging. You know, it, it's really playable and the greens are so large that even if you do make a green, it's very easy to three putt if you're, if you're not putting well. Yeah, one of the things they do well um, with the green complexes that I noticed was they, they you know, they use tiers a lot, um, little punch bowls, little turtle backs. I mean, like they did such, they do such a good job of kind of creating a course within a course when you get on those greens where you have to be really careful um, where you are leaving, you know, your approach shots because a green in regulation to your point is is not a guaranteed par um you if you're not on the right tier um jumping a little bit ahead into three which has that mega false front like 
if you're not on the right tier, best of luck to you. Yeah, and talking about three, so this is the first part three you experience on the course. And like he said, it is a steep, steep false front that goes into a giant sloping left shelf onto this green. And I think the day we played it, they had it tucked in the back left. They did. Or no, yeah, was it back wheels. right just on the just on the the ridge? I, no, it was back it was back left. It was a real okay. sucker pin it. Yeah. And I remember because I was very short. I was short on the bottom tier. I I, uh, I I did not and I had to put up big swing and right to left. It was rough. I think this was the first hole that I felt confident on my on my tee shot. So I think I hit it just over the left bunker corner and I was like mm-hmm. 20 feet out from it. So Yeah, I was a good Yeah, you hit a great shot there, I remember. <laughs> yep. So the very straightforward hole, the green is definitely a challenge on the hole. There are some bunkering that, you know, will will catch your ball for you, which I don't think is penalizing more than it is you know, a savior of you falling down the hill, you know, coming back down from the green. So, you know, that, that not much to talk about on three, just your typical par three with a nice, nice green. And then it really, really opens up and, and stretches out on the fourth hole on the par five. So it's a, in my opinion, one of the more daunting tee shots that we probably saw throughout the day. Um, you can kind of see to the top of the fairway and then it kind of slopes off left and a little bit down into a ravine. And so there's not much to see from the tee box for aiming point. You're kind of just hoping and praying you hit the center of the fairway and then it funnels left. Mm -hmm. So um, no bunkering anywhere on on the fairways at all. This one is all going to be affected by where you land the ball and kind of where it slopes that's going to leave you a decent or not so decent shot in so i don't i don't remember what i did on this hole to be honest i can't really recall on there all i can remember is the approach shot was daunting as hell coming in from from where that is yeah it was um it just it got tighter and tighter um, as as you got closer and closer to the hole, and everything left was essentially dead, um, and then everything right was like kind of this sheer hillside that just made it. I mean, you you, you accuracy was key on this hole. That was pretty long, so it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't easy by any means. No, and, and so. Once you, if you do hit a good tee shot, you're still going to be left with, you know, 240 to 260 in for most people because 515 from the tee box, the one daunting situation, I think they had the pin that day tucked back, or I think it was actually um, just front over the first bunker on the left hand side. So there's like three shelves on this green. So it starts off with a tiny shelf just to the right of the first bunker, hops up to a second shelf, and hops up to a third. And on this, I mean, you can kind of jam it home. I guess that's kind of your savior. It'll slow you down if you're jamming a shot home. But from where I was at, I hit it short. And then where the pin was at, it was so difficult to land anywhere near that pin if you weren't either going to roll into the bunker or... You were just going to get blasted long so you know that yep. it it's a tough test for sure and then we got hole five so hole five is the second par three that you um attack and to be honest very similar green to the first par mm-hmm. three i would say that's the one thing if i'm going to give any stick to uh to the course the yeah to the design is the par threes are kind of are kind of templates there's not a huge difference to them especially on the green level because this one again false front you know it's a kidney shaped green that goes left left to right not 
anything to really talk about here. It's, I mean, uh, yeah, it's essentially it's essentially three, but it was uh, like thirty yards longer. Yep. I mean, the only thing that makes this hole challenging is it's two o five, but it's a wide open green and then all you have are the bunkers on the left that to be honest at 205 is going to be more of a savior and there it's an easy up and down out of the bunkers because they're in immaculate shape so yeah i didn't have any issue getting out of the bunkers here all day no that's that's what it, this is one of the courses public this is probably the only public course that i've played in oregon where i feel like i can uh relate to tour pros when they ask for a ball to get into a bunker because they know that they can control it you know out of the bunkers that they're seeing at the tour events and pumpkin would absolutely deliver the same exact it's like man i would much rather be in the bunker than some of the rough spots because they're perfect they're well maintained there's a lot of sand in them uh yeah that was that was really fun to be able to experience that on a public course Oh, yeah. But it also makes you feel like the PGA Tour pros should play more of the uh, natural fescue bunkers so they don't get those lies. Because it, for amateurs like us, it's even easy to get out of them. Yeah. So, Absolutely. yeah. Again, not not too exciting with, with the fifth hole, but, you know, the shape is, is incredible. And I would say on the front nine, this is my favorite hole. So this is the the six hole, 366 yards from the blue, very, very scorable for a par five. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. extremely open if you play it correctly. So you've got about 200 to 215, 220 to play with, with an extremely wide open fairway, bunkers on the left hand side that can cause issues if you do hit a little wipey shot, you know, left. Um, but I would say the bunker greenside bunker is one of my favorite features on the golf course. Um, the cool thing with the greenside bunker, it's got these, um, little islands in the middle of it with natural fescue. That's gigantic. That kind of opens up around it and, and has sand all the way around these little, these little islands. And then the, shape of the green is almost like a triangle Mm -hmm. and has this really interesting false right side of the green so it has a giant slope uh ridge right in the middle that'll drain all your balls down to the right side or keep them up on the on the left if you hit it up on the ridge yeah this was another this was one that i i really really dug the the green complex on this one um it's it's uh they, they take the idea of a false front and kind of make it more lateral um, and just they take a hole that's really wide open and then make you kind of have to have laser accuracy coming in um, you know coming into the approach to have to have really have a, a decent shot at, at a birdie or par or whatever you end up putting for um, so yeah I, I agree with you this is definitely one of my favorite holes um, on on the front nine yeah i mean if you take the risk and hit it long enough to leave yourself with a nice short shot it's very scorable you just have to hit a like you said very accurate approach shot because you've got the large bunker on your left and then a creek that runs all the way along the right hand side of the green and wraps around the back so it's it's a little sketchy if you've got anything over a buck 60 i would say on your Mm -hmm. approach shot but if you can put yourself in eight iron, you know, to wedge territory, it's it's a very, very scorable hole. I dig it. I definitely yeah. dig this hole. And so on to seven here, I would say this was probably probably one of the more scorable par fives. Or I'm sorry, par fours on the on the course. Mm-hmm. Wide open fairway. I mean you really can't, can't get it. much more wide open on this guy. And then I remember you, you banged home a, a approach shot on this because yeah. it, it's so wide open that if it's kind of like the last hole, if you get it within, you know, 150 and in, 
you're going to have a very approachable shot because the green and approach area is gigantic. Yep. And the bunkers don't come into play because they're a good, like, 20 yards off of the green. Mm-hmm. So um, that that I thought was was great. And then we go to the eighth hole. And what what's your thoughts here on the eighth hole? Um, I, I, I liked it. Um, it, this is one where it, it's, it's de- deceptive. Um, and that's one thing that I, I really love in, in any type of architect or, you know, course architecture is I like it where, um, it's, it's not exactly, it, it, it looks like it should be straightforward. Um, you know, especially off the tee, um, and then, and then it, it, when you get up there and you see your shot, you're like, man, I, I actually did have a little bit more room than I thought, or, um, or I didn't. This is one where it looks a little intimidating off the tee, but when you get up there, it's like, man, um, I actually, I, I, I had some room here. Um, and so it's really like the second time you play this course, that's where you feel like you can get a little bit more aggressive. And I mean, if you can bomb it because it's, a little bit downhill um, on your approach. Um, it, it, if you're a bomber, I'm certainly not, but if you are, this one is one where you can kind of get after it um, and try to try to reach it in two, because there isn't like a ton of trouble. There is a green side bunker there, um, you know, up on the front right side of the green, but you know, if you can, you could blast it left and have a little fairly easy chip up onto the green. So, um, from from just a kind of a deception standpoint, this is one that I, I actually I actually kind of like this hole. Yeah, you know, and I would say this is this is what you call a Bryson DeChambeau special. So it's from the Blues five sixty two, which is very very deep for a blue for for most people of like a mid you know singles handicap. I mean that's fairly mm-hmm. deep. So yeah. and then the only defense, like you said, on the on the green is going to be that right side bunker. It is the smallest green on the course, you know, by by land size. But there's so much bailout area left, right, you know, deep that they, I mean, that's you could basically play it like Bryson would play it. You know, bang a driver, bang a three wood as hard as you can. And if you hit green side cool, you're gonna have a nice easy chip up. If you you hit it short, you'll have a nice approach. But for someone like me, it was a good, I think, a good driver, three wood, seven iron. So it it definitely is a stretch if you're not a super long hitter. I think I hit the mini driver on this one. You did. For my second shot, yeah. Yep. And I, 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 I crushed it, but I just sailed it right. And, but I, I think I only had like, I think I may have had like 100 yards in, but it was an 11 degree mini driver off the deck. So, um, so that was, yeah, that, that was a fun one. Yeah, that was, that was fun to see someone actually whip out the mini driver and use it off the deck. <laughs> and then we got hole nine. So I would say this might have been the most challenging hole that we saw up to this point on yeah. the course. Um, and, it's it's just long enough to where all the water in the creek that comes into play really comes into play. It's a good 443 par four. So it it's for a lot of you know courses around the Portland area, 443 would be a par five to be honest. And right. <laughs> so 443 with a creek that runs at about 220 yards leaves you close to another 220 in and there is an entire lake on the left hand side i mean i think both of us kind of stood up to this tee box and we're kind of like whoa what 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 do you do here oh yeah i mean this is one where if you're playing smart golf you you say you know what this is a bogey hole um especially for the the you know off the tee i think both of us um are from a distance standpoint it's like, man, if I can, uh, if I can make bogey, I'm going to call that a par. And if I can 
you know, roll one up there, chip up, one putt for par. I feel like I'm, I'm stealing one on this hole. It is the number one handicap hole um, on the course. Um, and, and there's a reason, like you said, you, you're, you're forced to lay up a little bit because you, you're potentially flirting with that creek that runs right through the center. And then um, you're, you're essentially looking at uh, just dead space on the left side if you, if you tug one because you're gonna be, you're gonna be wet. So um, super intimidating hole. Um, and we'll, we'll get another, another taste of uh, this, this lake uh, a little bit later in the round. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The lake comes into play multiple times on this course. And this is kind of your big first taste of it. And, and nine just, it kind of kicks you in the balls and then you're, you're left slightly wounded heading into heading into the back nine or back nine so you know after i think both of us definitely got over par on that hole um oh yeah i I think that i think i wrote down in my notes i was really glad the bar wasn't far from the green yep that that is 100 percent because i think we both walked in there tried to get some transfusions and the lady looked at us like we were nuts she had no clue what a transfusion was which is Hey, Pumpkin Ridge, absolute shame on you for not yeah. having your bartenders know what a transfusion is. It is 20, 20, what are we in? Am I am I this crazy? 22 now? Uh, we're close. It's still 2021 20, last time I oh, checked. Oh, still 21. I'm, I'm reaching. I, I want this year to end so bad. So, yeah, 2021, <laughs> transfusions are everywhere. It's a staple at golf courses. Get your shit together. Get, get that going. <laughs> no but no hate on them bartender was sweetest lady ever she she made us some great cocktails and we we headed on to hole 10 so hole 10 let's have you describe hole 10 here it is i would say another another tester to kind of get it started i I, it's not as friendly as hole one Oh, certainly not. Um, it's uh, it's a little bit of a of a trap, right? You know, when we're looking at the yardage, it's a it's a par five, four hundred seventy four yards from the blue. So, on the scorecard, on paper, you know, e- even for someone like me who's who's not the longest hitter, um, I feel like if I get a couple good pokes, I might be flirting. Um, I might be flirting with the green, you know, a, a green under regulation. But uh, with the bunkers on the left and the creek um, kind of running through the middle of this hole, uh, you have to hit a long and very straight drive if you want to have that opportunity. So in a lot of cases, the, the prudent play is to, is to take something that's straight off the tee and turn this into a three-shot hole. Um, and that's not what I did. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm not prudent when I play golf. I, I, um, I'm out there to have fun and, you know, for better, for worse. So, um, but regardless, it, it is, um, a great way to start the, the back nine. Uh, it, it gives you, it's a great risk reward hole, which I love. It gives you the opportunity to, um, you know, if you're, if you're down in a match to potentially, make some magic happen and get going and get some, some momentum on your side heading into the, the back half of the course. Um, but it can also, it can also do quite the opposite if you're not careful. So I was a really big fan of this hole, especially as, um, you know, the start to the back nine. Yeah. And, and like you said, the, the play here with it being so short and it's a par five really is hitting anything that's going to be about 200 to 220, which will leave you just short of the, the quadruple bunkers on the left hand side. And then you kind of have a wide open shot over the Creek that allows you to miss completely right. And, and that's kind of the play. Cause if you can get it there, and and have your third shot as an approach you're looking at a pretty pretty doable birdie but as you said i don't think either one of us were out there to uh play for a good score we were playing for to have a little bit of fun so i think we both pulled the driver on that and i think i sure did. ended up in the creek so yeah i think you did you you, you caught it good uh and we didn't know uh we we, we thought we thought you were solid because you absolutely roasted one. And then when we got down there, we didn't see it. And we're like, 
shit. I, yeah. I think it. I think it's wet. So, yeah, Especially just a, my a great shop. testimony. Yeah, yeah, it's so it's definitely for me. It would have been better if I hit a seven wood and then hit another, you know, seven or five wood in. It would have been a much better play, but hopefully I'll get another crack at it here coming coming soon because I definitely want to get back out here. So we're going to go to hole 11, keep it moving here. 11, par 3, again, kind of a switched template of the front nine. Um, it's a little false front that falls off the left-hand side this time with a ridge that goes up on the right. Again, not much to talk about. We're going to keep it moving. We're going to move on to hole 12 here. And hole 12, this, I think, is where the course opened up and, and entered kind of the area, the prairie dune kind of, you know, uh, old cow pasture style part of the um, course and you kind of open up come out of the trees and it just starts you know becoming wide open here and it's a nice little par uh four that's only 406 but it really really gets you off the tee because you've got all those trees on the right and so for you know smart players you would hit about a 200 yard shot 220 you know leave yourself with a nice approach in because the trees on the right hand side are just a bit too tall to kind of try to try to hit a driver over them you could go right of them go right over the cart path if you if you can pull that off but then you still have those trees short you know just right of the tee boxes so you know, from the blue tee boxes, I don't think that's really, really a play. So this is kind of a forced layup, you mm -hmm. know, in my mind. And yeah. then the green complex here, I think, is what really, really makes this this hole tough. So what what would you say, or how did you go about playing this hole? Um, I I tried to play it as close to those tall trees as I could um, and hit a little cut. And I actually did execute that, um, and I ran through the fairway. So I was I was playing from the rough on the on the left hand side, which was not a, an optimal angle into the hole. So um, it, you know, and then coming out of the rough, that was pretty sticky and was still a little bit wet. Um, I I ended up being short. A little bit short right which which was kind of tough um because you you're you're off a tight lie kind of chipping up onto a raised green um so it's you know leaving yourself that at least in in my experience there leaving myself that shot turned this into a bogey hole for me pretty quickly so i that forced layup really um kind of sets the tone for the hole which is which is cool. You don't you don't get that a lot. You get it a lot with par fives. Um, you, you certainly see, um, you know, course architects trying to get you to lay up um, on par fives to to take away that that opportunity for an eagle, but um, not so much on par fours. So uh, it was it was certainly a test. Yeah, you walk away with the par. You definitely felt like you walked away with the birdie on this hole. Yeah. So it, it was a test with that dog leg right over those trees. I mean, it it's a little bit of a tester there. And then the whole 13 par four, I would say this was easily the most gettable hole on, on the entire course. You know, it's really short. If you can hit, you know, your driver 250, you're only 100 in, and it is wide open. Yep. There, there isn't much that's going to get you on this hole. You know, it's pretty straightforward. Not a lot to talk about. There's a, there's what two, two greenside bunkers, right and left. Yeah, and really, I mean, the the left hand side bunker is the one that comes into play on the approach. That right hand bunker, if if you hit the ball fairly far, it, you could potentially roll into it. Um, but if like. Chris said, if you can, um, if you can hit a nice 250 drive, you're going to have a wedge in hand. And this is certainly an opportunity to get one back if you gave one up um, on the hole previously. Yeah, for sure, definitely. 
And then hole 14, again, my only gripe I think on, on Ghost Creek is gonna be the par threes. It's just not much to talk about other than the length. That's the only way that they're making the par threes slightly even challenging. But this one isn't really even even challenging in my opinion. It's it's long. Like you're looking at 220 from the blues. So it's it's deep. You know, for a guy like me, I'm pulling a five wood on this guy. And but what what I think is makes this hole easy for somebody that's just gonna grip it and rip it is the stadium the coliseum green so when when i describe a coliseum green it's it's like a bowl like when you go to a college campus and you go watch a football game most football stadiums are bowl shaped so the way this green is designed it does fall off on the front but the back is completely bowl shaped so if you hit it anywhere on the back you know or right side it'll kind of just funnel back into the hole. Mm-hmm. So it's there's really no defense. And again, it's a straightforward par three. It, there was nothing interesting here with, with the par threes at, at Ghost. And then wow. we get to hole 15. So this is where it starts getting challenging again. And this is a par five, you know, 531 yards. Bit of a beast with the dogleg left and the skinny green that run long back to front. And I think we had back pin that day. We did, yep. So it it plays more like 450 from from the back pins. Yeah, four, or I'm sorry, 550, 545. And yeah, the fairway, the fairway being pretty narrow, um, from what I remember, not not so much in the way of trees or anything like that, but but certainly the rough. So if you, you know, if you wanted to, w- w- with the length of the hole, um, you you really wanted to be in the fairway, so you had the best opportunity you could to punch it down there as far as you can. So if you were, you know, marginally left or right, you could end yourself in the rough and not have an opportunity to get it down into wedge territory um and i I think that truly was the defense because the the green itself wasn't i I don't remember it being all that complicated if you get it on the green you had a pretty good opportunity to to two putt or you know potentially potentially knocking a bird if um you know if you're close enough but um but that really was predicated on you hitting a great tee shot no absolutely and and this this is all about setting yourself up for success right off the tee if you don't do that on this hole it's going to be a deep scramble and you're probably going to walk off here with one or two extra strokes yeah and then we go to 16. this is probably the only interesting par three in my opinion on ghost um and it, the only thing that makes this interesting is this is the most bunkers I think you see on any hole in, on the entire course. Yeah. So it, it almost looks like an octopus when you look from like an aerial footage because it's just a big circular green that has all of these little finger bunkers that kind of go off of it. And it's not super long. I mean, it's probably the easiest par three on the course. But if you do miss the green, because it is smaller, nice little circular green, you know, you're just, you're in one of those bunkers. But again, like me and Tyler said, the bunkers at uh, Pumpkin are absolutely pristine. So this hole's pretty easy at 125. Yeah. I think we both walked off with a, um, I think we both walked off with two putt pars on this one. Yeah, yeah. If I remember, you you stuck one in pretty close here. I I'm pretty. If and I remember I just correctly, lipped it. and just lipped it. You were lipping them most of the day, day, but I I remember this. I remember this one being particularly heartbreaking because you you really stuck one close. Yeah, I Kardashian the shit out of this course and <laughs> and the uh, private side. It was it was so bad, and so we go into seventeen, and so I think seventeen eighteen. 
definitely give you that championship style finish. Very, very challenging. If pins are set correctly, it can it could be that that Saturday moving day situation where it could be extremely scorable on both of these holes or they could really tuck pins in very, very difficult spots and make it extremely tough to score and, and make it, you know, nearly impossible to get it in placement to be able to, to go under on these holes. You know, 17, very short, 301. Yeah. Um, what comes in defense is everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, every feature that we've talked about on the golf course pretty much comes into play on this this hole you know it i myself i think i took uh i think i took a five iron off of this tee yep. because i was so confused on what to do yeah you know yeah it, this is you go for it yeah yeah i was gonna say this this was my favorite hole on on the course um, I, I think it's really fun. It's a, it's a very, it, it's a total risk reward. So, you, you, you know, you can take your five iron or, or whatever um, club that's going to kind of get you into the fat part of the fairway, you know, maybe up 170, 180 yards at most. Um, but you're going to have a pretty difficult wedge shot because it's all carry onto a pretty small green that has a ton of undulation, um, a couple different shelves and bowls. Um, so you have to be, you have to be uh, on with your wedge game if you want to try to have an opportunity for birdie or, or a stress-free par. Or you can, you can do what I did and, and um, you know, challenge the creek and try to cover it, which I think it was about 235 um, or so, 235, 240 to cover. Um, and um, I thankfully hit a great shot um, and, and was able to cover, but that's still, that just makes your wedge shot somewhat easier. Um, but it's still, it's such a challenge. Um, so I could see, you know, on the pro circuit, some of these guys who can, um, you know, get a driver, or even a three wood up there, this is an opportunity for them to, you know, decide if they, you know, if they want to be a hero, um, or if they, if they want to play some, some smart golf. So I really, really love this whole, uh, super, super fun. Hey, Chris, I think you're muted. So there's a little interesting fact about this hole. In uh, 1994, so before Corn Ferry Tour, before web.com, there's a tour called the Nike Tour. And so the Nike Tour used to host a championship at, um, at Pumpkin Ridge and on the public side. So in 94, um, there was a guy named Mike Schuchart who double bogeyed this hole by putting it in the creek and then hitting one long and then double and then two putting and just demolished this hole and actually still won the championship, which was absolutely crazy. But that just shows you like this is, like you said, a risk reward situation if you hit a bomb and you make it over that creek left solid but to take that risk is is very very you know futile for somebody that like myself that calls myself very jordan spieth-esque and i would most likely hit it completely right and into the shit so i took it easy on that guy so just a little snippet on 17 and then 18 comes out and just really mind fucks you here. So you That's got 428, par four. Number doesn't make you scared, but you step up to that tee box and the trees on the left and right and the lake in front of you. What what were your thoughts coming up on, on this after we've been beat to shit all day? I, man, I was crying uncle at this point. Um, 
it, to have that tight of a window to, to, to thread a tee shot that needs to go pretty far, but not so far or far enough right that you're going to you know flirt at all with that lake. Uh, and then knowing that you have a very tough approach shot, um, you know, essentially over the water, or at the very least, uh, it's going to be in the back of your mind that if you if you push one right, uh, you're in the drink. So th- this one, in my opinion, is the toughest hole on the course. Um, I know it's the second second handicap um, on the card, but gosh, what what an incredible finishing hole! Uh, you know, to to send you home uh, just absolutely ex- mentally exhausted. Um, tr- tr- yeah, trying to trying to navigate uh, this beast. Yeah, and and I would say for us mortal uh, amateurs, it's it's a very tough you know final hole for someone like a pro. Even if they do stretch it out to the you know five fifty four, which is their back tees here. I mean, I'm sure they stretch it out a little bit more. The trees that come into play for us when we play from the blues or whites in the fairway, at that point, how high a pro hits it, those trees wouldn't even come into play. They would hit them right over those, just short of the creek, and have a nice little like 80, 100 yard, or not creek, but little pond, and have a you know, nice little 180 yard wedge in. That would that would be nice and easy for a pro. But for us, this is this is kind of the final nail in the coffin for for having such a challenging round out here. So, you know, if I could tell anybody finishing this, if if you normally play blues from somewhere, step up and play the whites. You're going to have a much more enjoyable time out here. Yeah, 100%. It so, was uh, from the blues, it was a challenge for sure. Definitely, definitely a big test. And... So after this, we we went went in and and talked to our girl inside and you know asked her if we should get lunch where we were at or if we should go over to the uh, private side because you know sometimes the private side has a little special you know little little trinkets over there and unfortunately the restaurant was uh, going through a menu change because they had the member guest coming over on the private side so you know us us public folk don't really know how to deal with that so we were just like oh, okay i guess we'll just grab a couple of quick sandwiches here on the on the public side at the bar and grill and then pop over there so she got us all set up you know us us schmucks that that chug along on the public side of of things you know, hop in our cart after we, we got fueled up and rolled on through past the gate, down the down the street, looking like crazy people, looking like we were sneaking <laughs> on from the public side. Which and we, we kinda were, you know, with kinda. with a little bit of access. <laughs> but the p- private side, to be honest, I would say the clubhouse itself on the private side is the coolest part about the private side. Um, Pumpkin does a great job with their merch. Unfortunately, I wish they would put some of that great merch on the public side as well. Because when we came in and talked to the guys in the pro shop when we first arrived to play, you know, on the ghost, it, the clubhouse just has your basic amenities you know your balls you know tees your basic nike polos you nothing nothing great there then we head over to the private side and the private side's got you know winston collection head covers they got Seamus stuff all over the place, you know, Lion even though we're more of a work. Muni Kid podcast, but yeah. Um, they, yeah, they had, you know, all the stuff you could think of that, that people want. Uh, what was the brand that, that had all the prints? Lion Loft. Yeah. Lion Loft There's had these great s- prints s- out there of like these like blueprint style drawings of the golf course from overhead and 
Yeah. And you could buy the public side one over there, but they didn't mm-hmm. have the public side one in the public club. I don't ask yeah. me why, why they have certain things, certain clubhouses. It doesn't make sense. You would think that people would come to visit pumpkin and want to just pick stuff up, even if they're not playing golf. So you'd think they'd want to have it on the accessible pro shop, but just saying, and they coming from a marketing a f- and sales guy. They had a full tray of uh, rangefinder batteries, which I found out um, after we finished the 18th hole, uh, which was my 36th hole of the day without my rangefinder. So uh, next time, next time with the opportunity to go there and my rangefinder craps out on the first hole of the day, I will remember that they have a tray of rangefinder batteries. This is true. This is true. They had everything <laughs> you can possibly think of, and we didn't even think to ask prior to starting the second nine. it Or second 18, my fault. So I would say after we finished, we'll, we'll start it this way. After we finished the 18 at Witch Hollow, I think me and Tyler both agreed that if we could take the back nine of the public side and the front nine of the private side and make one golf course that would be the best golf course that they have on property oh yeah because as you guys heard us say on the on the front nine of of ghost it's yeah it it's a great course don't get me wrong but the best holes of the course are on the back nine at Ghost, and the best holes are on the front nine at Witch Hollow, by far. Yeah. And the first hole, I think it really starts starts the tone when it comes to you know a great great you know start to a to a course, and you start off again fairly up front, three seventy nine par four. What well, what were your thoughts stepping up? to this first hole compared to to ghost uh it, it's um it, it was just more inviting uh, this hole really really just fit my eye um i had in my notes it was the perfect starting hole um it it was pretty straightforward you kind of saw everything that was in front of you it wasn't all that intimidating it was just really really inviting so you know, you had an opportunity to kind of pump a drive over the right-hand side um, bunkers, and then you kind of knew you were going to have a pretty short shot in. It's just a really fun way to start. Um, you know, to to start the, that front side. Um, I I just I I can't really say. I I can't say enough good things about this hole. Just just really really well thought out a great way to start the round i'm in the same boat i would say this was probably one of my favorite starting holes i've played in a long time the one thing i will say between witch hollow and and ghost are the conditions aren't any different i i would say there's a little less divots in the fairway a little less ball marks on the greens but that's just because lack of play. The actual conditions of the course, you know, tee boxes all the way to how well manicured the fairways and rough are and the, and the bunkers and the greens, there there wasn't any difference between the two courses. No, I mean, I, I if, if there was a difference, it was so marginal that you're not, I mean, you're not going to really be able to tell the difference. Even us who had played, you know, the courses back to back, um, it, it would have been really tough for us to, you know, you could have, you could have mixed and matched the holes. I really wouldn't have been, te- been able to tell you which one was public, which one was private, which is, I think a great testament to what they're doing out there at pumpkin. I mean, they're, 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 they're taking just incredible pride in the entire, you know, the entire, um, compound and not just not just pouring all the money into the into the private side which is you know fantastic for golf you know public golf here in oregon absolutely no 100 percent. and to be able to have courses like that in the reserve in our back pocket you know in in the portland area and i guess you could even throw the conditions at langford farms 
you know, in there because they're, I, to be honest, wouldn't put their layout at the same level as, as the reserve in pumpkin, but the conditions are just as good. So having those three type courses in our area is wonderful. Yep. And then hole two, continuation of the par threes from, from uh, Ghost Creek. So not much to talk about. 157 straight forward, you know, bunker on the left side, guarding the front. Other than that, very, very straightforward hole. Not, nothing to get at. The par three, this is where the course starts starts showing its uh, its difficulty. So this one is par four, uh, 386 yards, slightly uphill with a creek that runs along the front of the front of the green about 20, 30 yards in front of it. So here again is a little bit more of a risk reward shot so how how did you approach this hole um you know i i use those bunkers on the right hand side as kind of my target line because i knew i could get them just over um so that i'd have the shortest shot in just because um looking at the angle and the size of the green and kind of everything that was around there you know everything left is dead uh, that bunker on the right is placed very well. Um, so if you if you find yourself in it, as well maintained as the bunkers are, I'm still no stranger to absolutely blading the ever living shit out of one, uh, and that would have put me right into the water. So wasn't trying to put myself over there. So um, I wanted to get it down there as far as I could, so I had the best opportunity. I I would be able to uh, hit a really kind of controlled short iron potentially wedge in if i if i got got a hold of one but yeah total total risk reward here i mean you can certainly take those bunkers out of play you know play down the left hand side lay up a little bit you're gonna have a much longer shot in um if you're feeling comfortable with the mid to long irons um but uh you know it, if personally not not what i was feeling that day so I took the risk off the tee, which worked out okay for me. But um, you know, gosh, if you if you spray it a little bit right, you're in jail. Uh, so, t- very very difficult hole after one of the more kind of mundane, meh, very easy par threes. Um, kind of kind of a shock to the system. Yeah, and I would say I give a little credit to the golf course architect for that too. You have a very opening first hole second hole is very inviting you know par three and then this is where it kind of ramps up a little bit here it really slaps you in the face and i think for me i ended up in those right right side bunkers hit a little bit of a wipey drive i had to lay up in front of the creek and then hit over and i think i actually had to get up and down from there um Mm -hmm. for a par so you know, it it's definitely doable even if you do hit kind of a, a bad shot off the tee because it does give you a lot of option to kind of lay up and then and then very inviting green from there. So then we move on to the par or to hole four, par five. So this guy is this guy's a little challenging off the tee just because it's semi blind. It it goes uphill a bit. You kind of get to the top of the hill and then it slopes down. So for someone that's never played this hole, you really would have no clue kind of how it's going to react once you hit it up and over the hill. If you have played it, you know that it's pretty much wide open, slopes a little bit down to the left-hand side. And then the green is extremely inviting probably one of the biggest greens on the course in my in my mind and it just depends kind of on the flagstick position on on this hole that makes it challenging because you've got this gigantic front bunker that's got two island um two natural fescue islands in the middle of it and but at the at 533 i think it's a very birdieable hole oh yeah and so, you know, it's, again, beautiful, beautiful hole, uh, tree-lined, but 
wide open, very scorable, dug it, good good hole there. And so this is probably one of the better par threes out of both courses. So on hole five, you've got a 187 yard par three. Oh, basically have to carry water with three bunkers in the back. And the cool thing about this green is it's got kind of a little lip that runs along the entire backside of the green that funnels your ball back forward, which is good and bad because if the pin is playing front, your ball is going to come back to where it needs to go. If you hit a massive spinner into this, which if you're hitting it 187 yards, you probably aren't hitting a massive spinner into this you could spin it right back into the water. So that's that's probably where the defense comes in. But uh, again, at 187 yards from blue, you're, you're not going to be spinning it in there. And I, I think myself, I put it in the water on this hole. Yeah, and I, I actually, I think this is one of my best shots of the day. Um, I, I was able to put it on the green. Not not partic- the the pin was on the left hand side, which made the hole considerably easier. Not easy, but easier. Um, and I was I was able to uh, uh, get, get away with a par here. And I feel like I stole one because it, it is a it is a little bit of a intimidating tee shot. It's it's a total like PGA tour. This this is the type of hole you see on TV. Um, so that that was fun that that was for me it, that was one of the fun things about the hole is it reminded me of other things that i see on 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 tv every weekend watching the you know the best guys in the world play so um it, it was it was a pretty compelling par three on a couple of courses where the par threes were certainly not their not their strength yeah this this definitely is a hole that i would love to see from 211 from the backs I would love to see PGA pros hitting four and five irons from there and and stick in the green with, with this because, again, there is nowhere to land it besides the green. So, you know, it's definitely a PGA pro style, style, style par three. And then we go into six hole, which is super difficult. So this one is par four dog leg left 415 from blue but the tee shot on this hole so hard you just can't figure out where you i mean you don't have anywhere to miss it is dead ass straight down the middle with a massive tree farm on each side i mean it is dense there and then you've got nas- natural fescue kind of running along the tee box that makes it an absolute picturesque you know spot to hit a ball. But holy shit! I mean, on this hole you have to hit it about what 240, 230 to have a nice nice play in. Yeah, well, I mean you can't you you do have to take into consideration that bunker that's way out there on your on your target line because if you do get a hold of one you have the opportunity to kind of to run one in there and you know from from as far out as you would be into the green you know that you're hitting into that has just this massive ridge right down the middle that kind of bisects with the creek on the left i mean it's just this is one of this is one of the few holes on the course that i felt like you had to hit essentially two perfect shots if you wanted a, if you wanted an opportunity at a stretch free par or even a thought at birdie. Um, it, this was a super difficult hole. Yeah, and and then your approach shot. You've got a creek that runs all the way along the left hand side. Um, a kind of unnecessary bunker in the back left. I mean, there's rarely going to be an opportunity that you're going to hit in there especially with kind of the green false you know falling off the front and so it it's a it's probably the toughest par par four that we see on the front by far and then hole seven par five so this guy oh tight tight piece of property here i mean trees on the left trees on the right bunkers on deep left bunkers 
can, if you hit it wipey right, you're going to have them on in your play as well. 564 yard par five. I mean, for an amateur golfer that hits a 260, I mean, you're left with three bills in and you're still left with a massive shot in. I would say this might be the hardest par five in... This might be one of the hardest par fives I've played in Portland. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, it's just requires... Uh, insane amount of, of accuracy on every shot off the tee both your approach shots I mean in, unless you know you're a, unless you're a big big hitter you're not gonna ha- this is not ever gonna be a two two shot hole um, and and you don't really have anywhere to bail out left or right you just have to hit great shot after great shot after great shot if you want to have an opportunity to really even par here a birdie here it would be a phenomenal score i think a par on this hole is a phenomenal score not one not not the type of par five where you're you're saying hey i have the opportunity to you know to to snag one it's it's tough no easily one of the toughest par fives i've played in portland and if not in a long time so it's tough and then hole eight does not get any easier so hole eight is a par four 360 yards it's not deep but it's got nothing but fairway bunker challenges all over the place and and if you hit it wipey right you've got natural fescue and the creek that runs along on the right hand side and if you hit it wipey left you've got the bunkers on the left hand side and then there's also natural fescue and water on the other side of the the cart path so you know, for some, for for this hole, I mean, again, it's a risk reward. You pull a driver and you try to put yourself within a hundred yards, which will carry those left hand bunkers, or you hit something that's going to be 160, 180 in, and then at that point hit something that's 200 in. So it, it's it's a very tough decision, especially from an amateur golfer standpoint. Yeah, and coming into this green, this was one of the toughest greens I think on the course. Um, it's there's two tiers, almost three, um, depending. There, there's kind of two tiers in the front and one larger tier on the back. Um, I I think the pin was, I think it was back. Um, and gosh, I mean, like even even if you do hit a great a great tee shot and you have that wedge in it's another one where you absolutely have to kind of reminds me of 17 um a little bit um uh at at, um at at ghost um where you have to be dialed in with your wedges to get it on the right part of the green because if you're not on the right part of the green it's almost a guaranteed three putt no absolutely and it's just like i don't know this this hole was super difficult did not enjoy it especially with with the approach onto the green and the in the kind of like three ridges that go off in three different ways it was after that par five this just beat the shit out of you as well and then you go to nine which i thought was the other than the first hole probably the most inviting uh, hole on the front nine and i thought architecturally this was a spectacular designed hole you know it yeah i i'm a sucker for centerline bunkers centerline trees um and this this hole certainly delivers uh this was my favorite hole on the course by far um yeah i i have to agree with you that architecturally this was just yeah a, really a delight yeah, so it's it's not too long, 427, uh, par 4, wide, wide, wide open fairway, again, with the centerline bunkers. That's probably the only challenge that you have off the tee on this hole, because you can pretty much hit it anywhere you want. And then the challenge on this hole is more on the approach, because it kind of comes into a coliseum of trees 
that surround the entire green. So you have to hit an, and it's slightly smaller, more of a circular green. So you kind of have to hit a nice little approach shot in there and, and hit it tight because there's not too much room to kind of miss on the approach shot there. But again, wonderful, very pleasant hole to play. I think we both really enjoyed, enjoyed hole nine. Yeah. And then probably my least favorite part of this entire golf course the back nine has a great or so the turn has a great turn house i thought the yeah. turn house was super cool Loved great it. little barbecue they've got a lady in there that was making mixed drinks you know fun fun turn house and then you step up to this atrocious ass par three like horrible way to start the back to be honest it, it just isn't a good par three it's 194 yards pretty deep in just a wide open green bunkers short that to be honest should never come into play for anybody and then no. green side bunkers on the left and i just think it's a very unimaginative hole yeah, and it certainly doesn't do uh, do the course any favors in terms of pace of play, which was, I think, maybe our only knock. One of the knocks on, on the, the private side was um, pace of play didn't seem to be a, a paramount uh, priority for, for the membership. Not that we were going to say anything because we were, you know, we, we were fortunate enough to be invited out to play, but... Um, it, 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 it was a much slower round than, than the public side. Um, and a, a, a long par three is kind of mundane and meh as it is, uh, isn't, gonna, isn't gonna do you any, any favors in terms of trying to keep, trying to keep play um, moving along. So that it was frustrating. You know, we had been waiting quite a bit up until this point and then it just got log jammed. Um, after the you know after we spent a little bit of time in the very cool um you know tur turn house there um so yeah I, I agree not definitely not my favorite part of the course no and you're 100 percent right so the one thing with long par threes like this especially when you have amateur golfers playing it most of the time even on a private setting is they're gonna hit it wipey you know on here especially if they're hitting long irons or you know hybrids or whatnot it's the accuracy of amateurs are just kind of all over the place so you know it's just most people are gonna are gonna bogey this hole most people are gonna be searching for balls there's a fence that lo runs along the right hand side that is all ob as well so it's just it's just a poorly designed hole and it's not appealing either especially with the uh, the fence that runs along, you know, someone else's property on the right hand side. They don't even have bushes or trees that kind of block that out to make it a little more picturesque. I think it's kind of the ugliest hole out of both golf courses. Yeah. And then so we go to hole eleven. So I, I'm gonna just say this straight up. The back nine is so gimmicky on Witch Hollow. I think me and you both talked about it by like the 14th hole that it's mm -hmm. just layup after layup after layup after layup. It's just it it's just the same thing over and over again. And it's just it's just not enjoyable in my opinion. I didn't find it to be creative, you know, test worthy, anything like that. You know, especially from the amateur level where we're pe playing from only a certain distance. And so this hole is a par five, um, 531 yards. And it's just a double dog leg. So it dog legs right, uh, or I'm sorry, it dog legs left, and then it dog legs back right. And the way it's designed with the bunker and, and the trees and everything from our distance, it's just kind of like you hit a driver three wood, then you're either going to hit a three wood to lay up again because of the bunker and the tree on the right hand side. Yeah, this this was a, this is kind of where you are almost reminded, and, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't know this for sure, but 
you get the feeling, especially when you got into this stretch of holes, that this course and was truly des- you know they, they designed and built these courses with tour pros in mind, um, not necessarily your everyday amateur golfer, not you know the ninety eight percent of golfers that are ever going to be on this course, which was. Uh, disappointing, uh, I think from, you know, and it's not a knock on Pumpkin Ridge as a, you know, facility. It's not a knock on anyone that's working there. It's just, it, I, I think that the, the course was designed with, you know, with, um, PGA, LPGA, you know, AM, AM events in mind, you know, big, big name USGA events in mind where, you know, they're, they're, they're hitting it much farther than the average player is going to be hitting it. They're hitting shots that we're never really going to be considering. And um, so it can be really frustrating and at times boring to play on a course that is just not designed for you. And so these forced layups, um, while it might be interesting and make a tour pro think, um, it's it's mostly just frustrating for us. Um, so, and that's, again, it's not a knock on Pumpkin Ridge as, you know, as a facility. I think, um, you know, the, the condition of the course was just, was phenomenal. And um, it, it was overall very enjoyable to play, but the architecture did leave quite a bit to be desired from someone who is, you know, a, a weekend warrior um, most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of gave us the feel of what a lot of women knock on on golf courses is when you're playing a little bit more of up tees, it eliminates a lot of the architectural angles that are designed into the course. And because this course is designed to be played from such further back tees and gives you such different more dramatic angles for somebody that does hit it 290 plus on average it it kind of just puts you into into you know a lot of layup territory and it it just makes it not as enjoyable for like you said the weekend warrior so you know that it this is kind of where it started here for us i thought and then we go to hole 12 and 12 is uh, par three, uh, 127 yards. And I would say besides 18, this was my favorite hole on the back nine. Um, yeah, this is a fun one. Yeah. It's a very gettable par three from 127 yards. The green is protected by a lake that runs along the front end side of it. A kidney shape that gets smaller along the backhand side. Kind of almost looks like a squash. Uh, and then it's got a bunker on the backside that'll save you if you hit it long. and Or make it difficult for your approach shot. If you hit a, a little bladey one out of it, you could definitely end up in the water front side with that. And yeah, very straightforward. Really enjoyed this hole. I mean, not much to talk about with, with the distance and, and that. The only thing that made it challenging, I think, was the water. Yeah, I think if the pin, I if I remember correctly, I think we had a front pin, um, but I would imagine that if the pin were on the left towards the back, this becomes a little bit of a different hole. That landing area is pretty small compared to the you know all the room that you have kind of up front and and right. Um, so I'd imagine on a different day, maybe this hole is a little more remarkable, but. Um, yeah, very straightforward. It wasn't boring, but it also wasn't, um, you know, it, it didn't knock my socks off in terms of um, kind of it, it's, you know, the, the interest that it piqued in me personally. But um, I do think it was one of the strongest par threes on, on the course for sure. Yeah, yeah, especially architecturally wise and, and just the way it looked and everything. It was great, great off the tee. And then a very mundane par four, in my opinion. It's 390, straightforward. Again, not much to get into here. Uh, You've got some unnecessary bunkers front of the fairway that, again, if you're landing in there, you're just playing from the wrong tees 100%. There's a bunker on the left that causes a little bit of issue, but 
the fairway is so wide and so open that it, it really doesn't create much of a challenge. And then probably one of the best looking bunkers on the course on the left hand side of the green that runs probably from 30 yards before the green all the way to nearly the back. But it doesn't really come into play too much because where the pin's placed and everything like that, if you're hitting it that far left, then you're just having, a, other you're just having a bad day. <laughs> yeah, you got other problems there. But it's <laughs> mundane, boring, to be honest, not much to talk about. And then we go into hole 14 again not not particularly awesome angles for people like us and for anybody that uh that's an amateur because it's a 470 yard par five but there's massive water on the left bunker on the right hand side of the green and the green is super challenging. I think the day that we had it, they put the the pin left, front left, and it was tucked yep. behind the water. So yep. it was a nearly impossible gettable pin that day, even from the distance we were at. And the way the angle takes it, if you hit a driver and you hit it straight, you're probably gonna blast it through the fairway into the rough because it dog legs left. I mean, I guess for a play for us, it would be like three wood, three wood, and then a nice iron in. But again, I just feel, I feel it being unimaginative for, from the tee boxes that we played. And it's definitely a, a hole that's laid out more for the pro. Yeah, I mean it's it's just just on paper it's a risk reward hole. It's a short par f- five, um, where it's it's really its only defense is the, you know, what's around the green. Um, you're right where that pin was. You could if you're pretty much unless you were left of the pin, which was difficult to get to, you were above the hole, and so you couldn't stop the ball. You know, six feet from the hole so it was it was a really difficult two putt um yeah if you really laced a nice big hook you might have a shot at going after it in two although you know i i don't see you know i i think it was you know when, when i'm listening to some some of the two pros talk you know or at least max homa you know his philosophy is if i don't have the opportunity to make a three i'm like why go for it here is it's one of those ho- holes where especially with the green it's like yeah i can get it on there in two but i'm gonna have you know the the chances of me being able to make the putt are so slim i'm much more likely to three putt so i might as well just try to wedge it close for a birdie but again that's that's really showing you that this hole was designed with a tour player in mind not someone that is not you know that 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 is not at that level so it kind of adds to that level of frustration as we're going through this back nine yep absolutely i couldn't have said it better there and then we go to hole 15 there which is 157 yard par three and this hole was pretty cool i would say the green was probably the the most basic green out of all the complexes that we saw throughout all 36 holes we played that day you know pretty straightforward a little bit of runoff on the front side i mean a little bit elevated of a green you know with three you know long wavy bunkers that finger off of the front side but yeah again not much to write home about yeah, kind of a mat par three, but that was that was the theme of the day, it seemed. Yeah, yep. And then, so then you go to 16, par four. Again, 385. Straightforward, <laughs> straightforward, ri- boring, boring shot. The ri- it's the ri- driver di- three the ridi- wood. What were you going to say? I was just going to say the ridiculous bunkers at the at the front of the fairway you know the start of the fairway that just make absolutely no sense um you know they gosh we saw that like four or five times it's like why why are those five little bunkers there yeah it it literally comes into play for nobody it's a waste of time for your maintenance staff to keep those things up i i just it 
they're horrible designs for for any course and i i would say that's the we didn't see that as much on the uh ghost creek side and then you go into the private side and they've got all these stupid bunkers on the front of the fairway where they don't even play into anybody's game so i'm just i i was baffled all day when we were on the witch hollow side And, and again at 385 wide open not much challenge it three wood driver iron in it's very very basic hole i mean it's it's what we saw on the whole back nine it just it didn't excite either one of us to be honest and then 17 again 394 par four pretty wide open it's a little bit of a dog leg left but you knock one out there you know 240 ish to those bunker just just past the bunkers on the right hand side and again another useless bunker front left of the fairway that nobody is ever going to land in and this is almost a cart which you know again kind of going back to the a little bit uninspired a little bit just it seemed like every hole it, they all just kind of blended together i mean this is essentially a carbon copy of 14 but you don't have the lake up by the green or the pond up by the green but you know beyond that they almost you, it's almost like uh the 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 of course architect traced 14 and you know threw that into the routing for 17 so it's it's like you know i i think one of us said it when we were there it's like man have we played this hole already because i swear i swear we have played this hole um you know, you know, an hour ago, and uh, and it's you know when, when you look at the aerial shot of both those holes, it's like gosh, that is that is essentially the same hole. Yeah, and that's something you don't want to ever ever say when you play a golf course, especially something that has so much prestige as as Witch Hollow does at Pumpkin Ridge, because it's just like when when you have that and you have the you know you have the prestige and all the tour events and and am events and everything they've held at this place it's just when you go out there and experience it as an amateur you still want it to play relatively what you see on tv and then you just go out there and play it and you're like well it really doesn't give that experience unless you are a tour player and unless you see the angles and and all that that you see when you watch back on the 96 um you know am with tiger and all that it's it's a different golf course because they're just they're playing it longer it's just completely different at that aspect so yeah uninspiring and when you have deja vu coming into golf courses that's something you don't ever want to say about a golf course layout layout and I would say 18, visually, architecturally, was one of my favorite holes on on which, to be honest. Um, you basically get to bang it off the tee. It's kind of a cool tee shot because the fairway runs kind of at an angle. And, and you have to, you pretty much want to hit it as far as you can towards that back bunker. And then you've got this natural fescue that kind of separates the two fairways on 18. And then you've got a nice, you know, layup in from there that kind of brings you back into the trees. Yeah, I thought that this was a hole that they kind of redeemed. It it, kind of redeemed the experience. Um, It visually, um, you know, it, it, it engages you. It's, it's, something that um, makes you think a little bit off the tee but it's not overly hard it's not trying to force any tor- types of angles on you it's just say hey you know hit, hit as far down there as you can and you know you're gonna have a pretty cool looking uh, walk back in um, with kind of the trees um, they're all down on the right side at least the tall ones are mostly on the right side um, the left side a little bit sparse, but um, you know, a couple of weird bunkers at the beginning of the you know of, of this of the second fairway there, 
But there is that bunker kind of on the right that shouldn't really come into play, um, but I guess it could if you fanned one, especially if you were going for it. I, I could see if you were, you know, trying to, to send one, um, you know, from that from that first fairway. Up there, if you fanned one right, you could end yourself up in the bunker, but um, overall, this was a really fun finishing hole. Um, it was, you know, visually interesting. Um, definitely not like anything else that we had seen that day. Uh, the green was um, was was really uh, kind of big. It wasn't overly complicated. Um, just just a really fun way to finish off a really fun day. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think it wrapped up the whole day and, and our experience and everything like that. I I really really enjoyed eighteen. And then so to end end this episode, I kind of want to just go over: Is it worth it? to kind of join like so this is kind of a unique experience there's not a lot of properties out there that do have two championship style courses on the same property that are private and public it's just there's not a lot of those out there so it's very unique in itself in that aspect and it's funny how it's separated because it's very, very separated. The only thing that connects the two is the driving range, to be honest. And, and so for the rates that they charge per month and the initiation, which is probably one of the highest in, in the Portland area, to be 100% honest, between their Portland Golf Club and Oregon Golf Club, I would say are the, probably the three highest um you know private memberships and we're a public podcast you know we we like to showcase a good deal where you can find those and sometimes we like to showcase a premium course that just allows access to the public so with the rate that you get on the public side being up to 120 or twilight you know around the 50 dollar rate and then knowing that you know five figure or six figures is kind of the initiation to get into pumpkin plus you know substantial few hundred you know three four hundred bucks to to be a monthly member there after that is it worth it i mean in playing both courses if 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 you're um if your primary concern, if your your primary goal is to play great golf, um, you can you we we sh- we saw that you can do that on on the public side. Um, the differences in in terms of the the conditioning of the courses was marginal, uh, at best I would say nearly identical in most places. Um, so if if your primary concern is hey I want to play really great golf. Um, I don't, you don't, you don't need to shell out the money for a membership. Certainly there are other reasons to get a membership other than golf. And I think, uh, there are are a good portion of their membership that, um, you know, golf is certainly not the, at the forefront of their mind. Um, but I think that's one of the great things that pumpkin has done. And that was, um, it showed some really good forethought on their part to say, Hey, you know what, we want to create this, experience for our members um and that's great and that's certainly for a um a a certain certain audience but we want to be able to share the golf experience with the rest with everyone else you know um and i think for them to put as much pride or at least from what we saw right um put as much pride as they do into how well they maintain the public side Um, is a testament to how much they care about the golf and at the end of the day that's what we care about and so for me I would say as someone who's only primarily concerned with how well the course plays um, you can absolutely get that experience at you know 120 bucks a pop Um, you know if you want to treat yourself and go you know, prime time on the weekend, but you can certainly get better deals. Like you, you mentioned twilight or, or there are other deals out there. So, um, it's, it's one of the best, I think values in Portland in terms of you're not going to play a nicer course. You're not going to have the opportunity to play a nicer course, um, without having to be invited. Yeah, 
absolutely if you're if you're in portland greater portland area it is the best condition best layout course i think you're gonna get in the entire area hands down i mean it, it, the only other course i would say that rivals it would be the reserve and i think that's still a pretty steady like behind second it's it's I, still I, not yeah. even close I worked at the reserve for three years in high school. I know those courses very well. Um, I would I would say that there is there's a substantial gap between the the, the condition that that they're able to keep pumpkin at um, on that public side. They do you know the the superintendent there, the grounds crew there. You know hats off to them because they are doing a phenomenal job um, at maintaining that course for as much play as I know that as we know that it gets. Um, you know, they, you, you wouldn't know it, well, you know, kind of walking in, you, you, I could, I could walk on that course first time ever. And they tell me that it's a, you know, fully private and they get, you know, 22 rounds a day. I would say I, I a hundred percent believe that because they, they keep it, they keep it in great shape. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we had a great day out at pumpkin again i can't thank them enough for inviting the municipals out there and me being able to share that with tyler it was it was great to have you out there i really really enjoyed it again follow him on instagram he shouted it out at the beginning of the pod definitely definitely give him a follow and tyler thank you so much for coming on my man let's get out and play again very soon yeah, of course. Thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to come out and play. Um, it's uh, it was yeah, it was it was such a treat, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the next uh, next round. Let's go. Uh-huh.